right. Um, so my name is James Zirkert. I wrote a book about two and a half years ago called Flow Architecture. It's the future of streaming and event-driven integration. And rather than being a book that laid out here's how flow architectures are exactly done and here's the technologies that are used, um, this is coming at it a little bit more from the perspective of there's something coming up. There's something about to happen that is going to have a profound impact on the way we move data around the internet. And so what I wanted to do in the book was to lay out for you the case for what it is and why it's going to be that way. I'm going to take a sort of narrow down view of that today as I talk to you about the concept of flow and flow architectures and try to make convince you that there's some very important aspects of integration via EDA that we have not been able to take advantage of yet because we lack the standards to do so. So first, the term flow. Overloaded like crazy. I will absolutely admit that. So there, the term is used in not only within our industry across a thousand different ways, but across the, entire, the entirety of the English language in a thousand different ways. So I'll narrow it down for you a little bit for this context. I will occasionally use flow just to mean the movement of something through a system, okay? So just the, you know, the, just the movement of some material that's required by the system throughout that system. But specifically, flow with a capital F is gonna mean event-driven integration across organizational boundaries, meaning across company, between companies and institutions, or even within a large corporation between divisions that are independently operated. And then very importantly, through standard interfaces and protocols, meaning that the ways that you connect to streams are standard and that the protocols you use to be able to um, send and receive events are well known. Now here comes the, well, duh moment of my presentation for this group. You guys are all very aware of the basics of EDA, um, but, it's surprising for the number of people that you have to be very clear about a little bit more of this. So first of all, a really important part of flow is that consumers or their agents, agents being any technology that is handling the flow dynamics on behalf of somebody who's actually attempting to send or, or receive an event, like a, you know, like a Kafka or a Nats would be a good example, or it could be a, a, a service like Synadia or, or, um, or EventBridge. Um, producers, oh, sorry, I didn't finish my sentence there, did I? Um, so consumers uh, or their agents are able to request connections to producers through streams through self-service interfaces, meaning consumers initiate the request to receive data from streams. Producers or their agents choose which of those, um, those requests to accept or reject. Consumers then don't need to actively request any data from that point. Data is just pushed to them on demand when available. Producers maintain control of what events they want to send to consumers and when. And events are transmitted over the network using standard protocols, and protocols meaning more than just wire protocols. All kinds of protocols around sort of data structure and, and the way that events are formed, but uh, protocols about the way that communication is maintained and so on including to be determined protocols specifically designed for flow mechanics. And a lot of you are probably saying, well, and which is why I said this is kind of the blindingly obvious piece, this just sounds like PubSub. And that's true. It's true, it is very much like PubSub. But the one thing I'll notice is most people think of PubSub as connecting to some sort of stream processing, some sort of topic, or, um, or you know, something that has topics or subjects of some sort. But I will note that a direct connection via um, HTTP and WebSocket, in which the consumer makes the request and the rest of the rules are maintained, absolutely qualifies. So it's not required to be PubSub, although I think everybody would agree that the most likely mechanism that we'll be using for event-driven integration will be some form of PubSub with some form of uh, queues and topics involved. So next question you probably have is, so what? And it's a very valid question. When you have large-scale complex adaptive systems, and this is where I'm gonna get a little bit metaphorical, philosophical for just a little while, just to get a, an emphasis across about what's gonna drive this. 
Um, when you have things flowing th through a complex adaptive system of some sort, there are a lot of very, very common patterns that come out of that. Um, take our water cycle, right? You have the movement of the water through the system. Nature tends to then draw to where the water is, and therefore you get a lot of nature that, that evolves around lakes and rivers and streams that doesn't evolve in the middle of the desert. Um, and you have life that involves within the water as well as a result of all that. Our human body is a system in which something has to flow in order for the system to work. We need oxygen and nutrients to be delivered to every single cell in our, single, in our, in our system, in our body. We need to be able to make sure that as we grow as human beings, as we evolve or as we grow, um, that everything is still fed correctly by whatever is needed <laughs> in the system. So uh, another good example of this is the economy. So um, in order for an economy to work, goods and services to be able to be exchanged to anyone who needs various goods and services that are out there, the appropriate exchange of wealth has to happen in order to make it possible for the right resources to get to the right places at the right time. And what's super interesting and what is very applicable here is Jeffrey West, who's a scientist at the Santa Fe Institute, which is a really incredible academic institution that studies complex systems and complex adaptive systems, wrote this amazing book, highly, highly recommend this book, called Scale. And what he notes in it is that the basic mathematics of flow within complex systems drives those systems to evolve into very, very similar shapes and structures over time. And you can see this, I think, most easily in the um, overhead view of a city, right? What you end up with is sort of major through fares for large amounts of flow to happen that are fed by and feed to larger sort of um, artery roads or whatever you want to say, main commercial roads, which then in turn feed major neighborhood roads, which then ultimately feed the neighborhood streets that hit individual homes and businesses, right? So there's this a very sort of trunk, limb, branch, and then leaf kind of shape of things that happens, which is really consistent across all of these different systems we talked about. And all of them sort of have a drawing force in a sense that both drive the shape of that system and drive the movement and the, the continuous flow of the system. So in our economy, it is the need for or desire for wealth, goods and services that ultimately allows sellers to find buyers and buyers to find sellers. They're seeking each other and they actually end up making those connections and allowing those exchanges of wealth to occur. In the body, your brain actually plays a role in understanding where to open up more blood flow. Yes, the heart is the pump that's moving and providing the force of the blood flow, but your brain plays a role in deciding, hey, you know what, you've been exercising a lot. A lot more of your blood, a lot more oxygen needs to go to your muscles for now. You just ate a big meal, let's shift that to your digestive system. Let's make sure that you have a huge amount of blood flowing to your digestive system. One of the reasons you fall asleep after a big dinner. Um, and if you, if you have something where you're dealing with stress and anxiety, your brain might get more of that blood flow. And the analogy I want to kind of focus on a little bit more here then is that analogy of, um, of, of the water flow and, the, and the, the water cycle. Because in this situation, the, the force that draws and moves the water is basically gravity. It's a combination of gravity and heat from the sun, right? And so, and things are drawn to that flow of water, as I talked about earlier. And that basically, if the landscape changes, the water might change. As a result of that, the water might carve a new route through the landscape, and nature will adjust to what happens to that water flow. The key element here, and the metaphorical element, let me just say, here is gravity. And we're going to kind of dig into that a little deeper. Okay, so. How many of you have heard of data gravity? No? Oh, wow. A few, yeah, a few AWS folks I, hate, I see in, in the back there. All right. A gentleman by the name of David McCrory wrote a blog post 
12, 13 years ago now, in which he postulated that data has gravity, meaning that applications and services will move to be closer, closer in the network latency and throughput sense to data um, when it has more gravity. And he actually did a whole bunch of work since then, research on that. He's got some mathematics around it. There's a lot of proof that says that where large bodies of data, well, I shouldn't say large bodies of data, I'll explain that in a second, but where data has the form of gravity he's talking about, people will move their application services to be close to that data. In fact, the AWS people won't like me putting it this way, but I will say this, it's Amazon's business model to get your data in Amazon and residing in Amazon because it has gravity, because it draws you there, okay? It's not a bad thing, they do a phenomenal job of it, but be aware that if you look at the way they charge for data flow, it's fairly obvious, right? Getting data to Amazon has the value of bringing your applications and services to that data. Now, many of you may think when I say, oh, data has gravity, well, it's gotta be the amount of data. So large data source has to have a ton of gravity. But in fact, it's not the size of the data, it's the importance of the data that draws that. Importance in the sense of monetary value, importance in the sense of the ability to do some major function that's required, importance in the sense of um, timeliness, which will mean more here in just a second. But it's how important the data is that creates that gravity. And what I'm gonna argue today is in fact, that that data gravity applies to real-time movement of data as well. It doesn't just um, apply to stored data, but it, data in flight, it also applies to. Because as data, f as data moves over time, there's this interesting concept that data actually has a half-life of importance. It has a half-life of value. So when it's initially generated, there's a ton of value, and for the initial time period immediately after generation, it is the most valuable it can be. Um, and that's almost always true, not 100% true, but it's 98% true. And therefore, people who want to take the most advantage of that data are gonna to attempt to process it as fast as they see it. The most obvious place where this is, comes into play is if you look at high-speed trading on the stock market. Right? There are systems that are trying to react within milliseconds within, or sub-milliseconds to uh, buy and sell orders showing up in markets. And they are located physically, sometimes even in the same racks as the market making uh, servers are, are, exist. Right? So, so there, there's an ultimate key element of absolute value kind of up front. But that doesn't mean then that once it's been processed for that purpose, there's no value to that data anymore. In fact, if you look at that idea of data gravity and the importance of data as it flows through the system, you actually have a thing that behaves very much like that water analogy that we're talking about. If you've ever dumped a bucket of water on a beach and watched it make its way back to the lake or ocean that the beach sits on, you know that water can apply a fair amount of ingenuity in some weird sense of being able to use gravity to find its way back to its starting point. It'll carve its way through sand if it needs to, it'll work around something that it can't easily erode, and it'll make its way down that path. And at enough volume, that becomes a tremendous amount of force. There's a huge amount of draw to make that water rush where it's going. And in the data sense, what I would argue is there's an importance curve as long as there is value to the data that's been generated, there's still an opportunity for somebody to recognize that value, that importance, even downstream from where you go, okay? And I argue that, you know, I'll just put a term on it for the, the sense of the, this conversation, there's sort of an importance curve that's, um, that's generated from all of that. So where does that come in then with, um, with why flow is gonna be? Well, Flow does some interesting things, right? So if you have these standards and interfaces and protocols, and people are building libraries around those standard interfaces and protocols, and people are 
building common skills and common knowledge about how to do things or common protocols being built on an industry specific standard, uh, on a business specific standard. You start to lower the cost of integration for real time data by orders of magnitude. I mean, if you think about right now what it takes for you to say, hey, I want to make some data available to an outside entity and what you would have to do to arrange to have that data available. You could use EventBridge to do some really cool things, but you'd still be talking to those other people who want to consume the data about, hey, here's the format of the payloads, here's what you need to know in order to get a, the right IAM role to connect in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's, it's getting there, but it's not there. It's still very, very um, labor intensive and, uh, and time intensive in order to be able to make those connections. If you were able to just say, hey, here's my stream URI, and here's the schema, you can make that connection. And by the way, the, the, the consumer has a library that can say, okay, that's cool. Um, I just give it the URI and the schema and everything else gets translated for me. That's an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude for easier. It also then generates really composable solutions because um, as we'll talk about, like, it, especially if like the metadata is common as well for the event, you're able to very easily sort of say, hey, point anything at any stream and then it can figure out from the metadata, it can figure out through the interface um, and through the metadata whether or not it can um, consume the payload fairly easily. But I could set something up to consume any payload or I could set something up that there's a standard payload for a given industry or a given activity. And then anybody who's doing that activity or, or, or is in that industry can connect and be able to consume that very easily. And so you get a composability that we don't have right now, frankly. We don't have that ability to sort of say, hey, I have a stream available. Anybody can figure out something cool to do with it. Um, here's the URI. And finally, it allows for a really rich solution, a really rich solution ecosystem to build because that composability is going to drive people to find commercially valuable things to do with those streams. And as each solution gets better and stronger and solution space gets stronger, that's going to encourage even more people to experiment in the space. And ultimately, you have people who just kind of use real-time streaming as their default way of communicating data when, it's, when they're actually you know, attempting to do an event-driven approach to something that they're doing. You don't have to use APIs for things where, in fact, all you're trying to do is signal to other people what's going on. And so, um, again, I wish I could say this is what the world's going to look like specifically, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, out of this will, have, will likely uh, evolve a very rich uh, capability of business, cap um, of business systems that can connect to each other through event streams. And what happens when you reduce the cost to that extent and you make things much more available like that is um, something called Jevons Paradox, which basically says that it, Jevons basically was studying steel production in Britain in the late 1800s. And what he noted was as the cost of steel production went down, the overall spending on steel didn't go down. In fact, people found new uses for steel and new capabilities to consume steel. And, if, and the overall spending on steel went up dramatically as a result of the cost of producing steel going down. In the very same way, what I would say is the use of events to connect between organizations will go up dramatically as the cost of making those connections goes down. And so if you lower the cost of integration by orders of magnitude, you will drive significantly more real-time streaming integration. All right, so that's sort of the the philosophical section of our, our presentation today. Let's talk a little bit about where EDA is today and, and kind of talk towards what it's going to take to get to that image a little bit. This is um, from the book, and this is uh, Derek Collison, who's the creator of the NATS um, queuing system, if any of you played with that at all. Um, Derek's been in the EDA slash messaging industry since the early 1990s. Knows the stuff backwards and forwards. And he said there's basically, in all those years of doing this, there's basically four use cases for, um, for event-driven or, or uh, signal-driven technologies. And 
So this is really, really useful. But what a lot of people turn around and they say, oh, this is great. Because now I can sit down and say, hey, what's the technology that I should use for each one of these categories? And you know, of late, the answer from the ADA industry has been pretty consistent. <laughs> but um, but it, I think this just goes to show that this is, in fact, the wrong way to think about the problem. It's not the category of application that determines what technology you should use to solve an event streaming problem. It is the way you want to process the stream. And so this is a map that I built with um, with the chief architect of the eventing and messaging systems at Microsoft, uh, another contributor to the book. And the way to look at this is essentially that as I start at the beginning, the first question I want to ask is, am I, in fact, just sending messages between applications that are having a conversation, which is a very, very common and, and worthwhile thing to do. What you would use SMS for the thousand times over, all of that is totally great. If, you're, if routing messages is your number one problem, then there's some great technologies. And so something, and you know, I'm with VMware, so I got to throw in at least one VMware product in there. Um, but RabbitMQ is a great example of something that's really, really good at solving that problem of, hey, I just have some things that need to subscribe to the same communication channels and be able to communicate to each other through those channels. But if you're actually trying to send signals from one source to another, and that's the way you think about the problem, is I'm not trying to have a conversation. I may, in the big picture, have a conversation via events. But in reality, what I'm trying to do is make sure I'm sending signals out from a source to one or more consumers. Then you start to have some other decisions that you can make that are really useful. So for instance, is this uh, a series of events that I have to be able to track and work on um, as a series? I need to be able to step through series of events and re-step through them again or, or, um, or go back in time and double check that I have all the right steps in series. Absolutely a log-based processor in that situation, the right technology to use. Amazing stuff, super powerful, highly recommended. But if you're trying to process discrete events one at a time, which is actually a surprisingly large number of the use cases that are out there, then all of a sudden you have some interesting uh, and better choices. So for instance, if you uh, need, need to, or you have an event that's gonna trigger a series of steps that need to happen next, like, so they're gonna trigger a process, then step functions all of a sudden looks like the way to go, right? Something along those lines that's really powerful and, and, uh, and worthwhile. Um, but I'll also say that uh, um, if you're not kind of doing that series of stuff and taking a single action, you now have, still have a choice to make. If it's a atomic transaction, you're not keeping track of the state um, going on from that point forward. Now you get to Lambda and you get to Event Bridge, which are, um, I mean, Lambda is just a game changer. We all know that. But that ability for you to say, hey, as each event comes in, I want to be able to do some processing on that event, and I just need to write a function to do it and need to put it out there, that is a super powerful thing. But being able to route an event really easily as well with a limited set of rules to a number of other things that may want to, other topics or a number of other things that may want to process that data, that is also incredibly powerful. And as we'll talk about it later, it could even be things that are outside of like the basics, right? They are outside of the stuff that you wrote. It could be to a SaaS system. It could be to a number of other things. And then the one that I think is really interesting that I'm not sure that I've seen a great solution from AWS for, but that I think is incredibly powerful if you have certain classes of problems is a stateful processing environment like Flink. I used to use swim.ai, um, which it's it was an amazing project, um, but which recently got sold off. Um, but basically what you're thinking about here is digital twins, right? The ability to build out a running in, in memory, in, uh, in the network representation of, your, of the state of your system that you're monitoring and, and using and capturing in real life as a digital representation and the ability for those digital representatives to communicate to each other to be able to trigger actions back in the real world. Um, 
at a later point in time. So there are people doing some incredible things around here. Traffic systems today, um, increasingly a larger and larger number of them are being built as digital twin models so that uh, they, it's not intersection by intersection decisions um, about traffic light control, but they're actually able to monitor through the entire traffic network and be able to coordinate the signaling of light so that they can move traffic through as optimally as possible. All right. What I want to talk about next is the things that are happening that show that flow is starting to come to be. That in fact, event-driven integration is important and that they're coming in. I've been playing around with this term proto flows, meaning these are prototypical flows that are out there today that are showing that the demand uh, for these kinds of connections are out there and there's a huge amount of value to be driven. Walmart has for the longest time had the ability for you to connect um, and send them inventory data for the purposes of their online environment, uh, for their online shop, um, and also for their warehouses and, and store stocking. Um, there's a couple of choices. They have an API for this, but they can use EDI, and the way they use EDI is very event-driven in the sense of, I don't say event-driven, but it is very real-time flow of data in the sense that um, there is a protocol of communication with documents that allows you to very quickly update them on inventory on whatever time, uh, uh, time you, you want to, right? So as, as fast or as slowly as you want to. Um, so EDI is not event driven in the sense that it, it meets the criteria of you know, consumer subscribes or, um, or any of those things, but it is a really good example of something where a really well-known protocol of communication um, and a commitment by both ends of the wire to use that protocol to communicate as quickly as they can with each other can be set up to do some very, very sophisticated things. EDI, EDI in, a lot, in a very big sense, um, uh, is a very sloppy form of event-driven integration in a lot of ways, right? Um, it's just, it's, you know, certainly the consumer has to go and pull and look for documents, um, but it is something where it's meant to be, hey, I'm signaling to you that this information is available, and then you let me know when you've received that information. Um, even more directly is the FAA, which um, if you ever used one of those apps where you point your phone up to the sky and you can say, hey, what, what is that airplane? What's its flight? What's its destination? They're getting that data in real time as an event flow um, through JMS of all things, right? So that's what the FAA offers you is Java message service as a way of doing cross-organizational integration. Um, now, it's their custom protocol for the events. It's um, it's JMS, which is a very limited reach in terms of technologies that can consume it. But it is very, very much a flow in the sense of everything else. And then EventBridge. And I called this out the moment EventBridge was announced, but I will call it out again. The smartest thing that EventBridge did for you when they came live is they said, hey, we're going to go, we went and worked with certain of the biggest SaaS vendors, and we made sure that events to and from their systems, or events from their systems, API calls to their systems, are readily integrated into and available from, the, from EventBridge for you to quickly connect to and quickly be able to interact with. So if you use Salesforce for any of your key data and any of your key transactions, tracking customer experience, tracking uh, sales, tracking whatever, you can very easily write applications in, in AWS serverless that are able to connect to and receive events from Salesforce and make calls back into Salesforce to update data in Salesforce as required through EventBridge. It's cool, it's really cool stuff. Um, and that, again, AWS still uses their kind of own proprietary way of doing these things. There's not a standard interface to it. There's not a standard protocol to how you're talking to the vendors. But this is the kind of very, very quick and dirty, extremely low uh, cost of integration story that we're looking for here, right? All right, final little part of what I wanna to talk to you guys about today is then 
what are the things that are happening to actually define those standards and protocols that get us closer and closer to the worldwide flow? And the worldwide flow, basically, I'm not tied to this. I'm not trying to create a term that everybody in the world uses. Um, but it was the best term we could come up with when writing the book for what I think is the ultimate outcome of all of this. The tagline of the book has been, as HTTP connected the world's information and created the World Wide Web, flow will connect the world's activity and create the world's wide flow. Right, the idea that we are, we're constantly signaling across business lines, uh, boundaries across the internet as a economy, as a community, uh, and a society in order to be able to trigger much more real-time activity. Um, is a, it's a really important kind of baseline concept of where we can go to and how important this will be to the way we communicate uh, digitally um, with each other in the future. And so there's some really great stuff underway here. I would say there's a 90% probability that, a cl uh, that CNCF cloud events is going to be the metadata protocol that we're going to use for cross-organizational boundary um, eventing. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, I'll, I'll, I'll put up a slide about it here in a little while to give you a little bit more detail about what cloud events is. But understand that there's a huge list of vendors out there, including major cloud providers. AWS has participated in it. I don't know how they're using it. I haven't seen any public representation of it. But um, Cloud Events gives a really consistent way of describing the metadata that's really flexible in the right ways, but rigid in the ways it needs to be. Um, wire protocol-wise right now, um, if you're in some specific areas like IoT, you might use something different like uh, MQTT or, or AMQP or something. But in reality, what uh, most of the experts that I talk to um, agree on is that web sockets right now are just, is just the most flexible option. So events being transmitted by web sockets um, over HTTP is, at this point, the, the, the most likely. I, I would say that that's, its probability isn't as high as a winner as cloud events is. Um, on the publish and subscribe side, I, I think that's where there's a big gap. There's not really an API for, for making a simple request to connect to a stream that stands out yet. You could argue, you know, you could argue that whatever it is that AWS is doing with EventBridge, whatever the, uh, is, is the winner in the AWS space right now, but that's certainly not the you know, cross-internet, worldwide flow kind of story. Um, so there's opportunity in a huge way there. There are some groups that are trying to make some of that happen. Um, so a little bit more subscription-focused kind of approaches are standing out a little bit right now, meaning that they're, they're focused on the ability for consumers to subscribe to something, but they don't really handle the publish-subscribe relationship. Um, and so Cloud Events did a subscription API. It's, I was just looking at it the other day. It's a fairly dead project right now. Um, it's, it's still officially active, but it, it hasn't really changed for a while. Async API stands out right now as, um, as the one with the most activity and the most uh, conversation that's going on. Um, and I think, you know, I, uh, I think there are pros and cons to using Async API, but certainly if we all agree on using it and, and it becomes the standard, and there are some standards built around API, Async API to kind of narrow it down even a little bit more. I think it's, it's, it's great technology for the purpose. Discovery is one that people don't think about. I mean, how do I find that there's a stream to connect to in the first place? Um, and so there's an awful lot about a talk already about, hey, we should have registries of available streams. And EventBridge can be thought as sort of moving in that direction to a certain extent. Um, but I'm going to be honest and say, you know, I look at APIs, and I look at API discovery, and the vast majority of API discovery is just people Google, hey, I need an API for whatever, and a web page comes up and it has the documentation for how to do it, and there you go, you have your connection. I think that's exactly what will happen here, too. All right, I promised that I'd talk a little bit about cloud events. It's on version 1.02 right now. Um, there's some activity I was just noticing last week that seems to suggest that they're, they're looking at doing a little bit of an update, but the core standard itself, the core, uh, uh, the core grammar and terminology 
Uh, it doesn't look like it's gonna change, it's just more about support for certain technology spaces um, that it's gonna change. Um, so you basically have a type system that is, uh, just gives you a consistent way of, of typing the data that's in these things. They look like headers in some ways, right? They, they look like headers that go on, uh, uh, that wrap around whatever your payload is. Um, a set of required attributes that have to be there in order to, uh, for any system to be able to look at it and say, can I process this in some way, shape, or form? And then a group of optional attributes, many of which will be used all the time but are still optional technically about, you know, what's the data type, what's the, um, you know, where, where, where do I find the schema, um, what's the encryption type that I need to worry about, or, you know, is an encryption uh, publicly that's get, being transmitted or where do I find that information. All right, and then the last thing I wanna talk about here real quick, and I might be slightly early, or right on time. All right, um, the last thing I wanna talk about here real quick is AI, because you can't have a presentation <laughs> these days without mentioning AI a little bit. But I was just, I believe AI might actually be the killer app for Flow. And the reason I want to say that is because one of the things we're seeing with early AIs is that they get dumber over time. They actually make more mistakes the longer that they're churning on the same, uh, the same experience that they're having. And part of that just is that it's hard to update them with the latest, greatest, and hard to provide feedback loops back into the models that say, no, that's right or that's wrong, and, and push them in the direction of being increasingly um, correct. Not, you know, not just predicting that this should be correct, or, or this is the words that I expect would be next, but understanding a little bit better that these words are actually, these terms are actually gonna lead me in the direction of correctness. So I think that the big technology that needs to be built over the next few years is that feedback loop of A, how do I stay up to date on the real data that's the latest, greatest for whatever it is that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to communicate about as an AI or that my models are built on. But B, what's the feedback loop? What are the mechanisms to make me able to quickly tell the AI and the model whether or not the model is more correct or less correct than it was before? And so eventing seems perfect for that to me. It seems like a really ph phenomenal way for applications to be able to, either humans through applications or applications themselves to be able to communicate uh, back to the AI about uh, the correctness of the environment that they're seeing, um, the results of actions taken based on AI um, results. Uh, and also to be able to update the models with more information on, uh, on a steady, regular basis. So again, really early days for AI, but that idea of, of having a real-time flow and, and, uh, and feedback environment is critical, and I think having a standard interface and protocol that you can use across organizational boundaries is in fact the thing that has to happen in order to make that work. And with that, I'll say one, just one more time, there's a lot more information here. Uh, I did some really interesting work. If you wanna understand how I'm so darn confident about this stuff, I did some modeling work in Wardley theory and promise theory in order to, um, to, to define the parameters that say that this is a very, very likely thing to happen. Um, there's a lot of analysis of the current state of the technology um, that we have today and how it we've set the stage beautifully. Things can happen very quickly, but also why it's gonna take, I mean, I wrote it two and a half years ago, I said it would take a decade, so I'll, I'll stick with it. You know, it, It's not gonna be a mainstream topic of conversation for another seven or eight years. But the reason for that is because there's problems to be solved that we're gonna to get to with this. As we build these protocols, we're gonna figure out how do we deal with monetization? How do we deal with, with security and encryption? How do we deal with, uh, um, you know, with consistency in the libraries in terms of interpreting both the metadata and the protocols, right? So there's a lot of information in this book. Highly recommend that you pick up a copy. Uh, happy to answer any questions you guys have over the course of the day. I'll be here until about 5.30 or so. And uh, I look forward to meeting many of you, and thank you very much.